This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. It is a massive day in Major League Baseball because today is the opening day of all four divisional series across Major League Baseball. It's going to be a delight. We're going to break things down from a strikeout prop perspective with Rob Friedman, Pitching Ninja, getting his thoughts on today's games. And we'll take our first look at week six to get you set for the NFL as well. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sadas. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here once again by Rob. Rob Friedman, check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. He is on MLB. He's on Fox, Nesson, and Peacock. And Rob, it's the opening day of the divisional series. I feel like you've got to be jacked right now. How are you doing? I am jacked. It's the morning, though. Like, I'm just getting around to getting ready for the games, getting psyched up <laughs> gradually because I don't want to peak too early. But the problem is the game start at one. Like, you they don't do. got a lot of time to ramp up. Like, and we're, the we're in the thick of it right away. Atlanta. It's the Braves and I'm in Atlanta. I've got I Yeah, know. I mean, <laughs> I know. But if I, if, I, if I get too fired up now, I'll be petered out by one and certainly mm-hmm. by the whatever the late game is. Yeah, I mean, 9.37 p.m. Eastern is the, the Dodgers-Padres okay. game. I'm, I'm old, man. Like, that's 9.37 is when I start to prepare for bed, typically. So they're pushing it this year. As yeah, oh, yeah, totally agree. And and like they don't understand like how tough this is for me. Like I, yeah. I, I <laughs> so one one to midnight is eleven hours of you chopping up, you know, clips. At least it's not like sixteen games going at once. You get some commercial breaks and stuff like that in there. But like that's a that's a stretched out schedule. They should uh, consider things over there. It, it, it is. It's tough being me. You know, watching all these games yeah. and putting them on social media and stuff. Like yeah, everybody out there feels sorry for me. I think they consider should. the gifts, guys. Like let's go. Come on, that's let's right. uh, let's. I mean, you you do stuff for MLB. Like come I on, do. just put in a word. You know, just say hey. By the way, uh, consider the ninja at uh, sometimes. Uh, yeah, the problem is things. then they'll do them all at one time, and oh, that's, that's worse, worse for yeah, me. Yeah, like yeah. it's definitely oh. worse because. I'll be sitting there going, oh, my God, like I have to flip between screens. Like <laughs> no matter what, I'm going to whine and I shouldn't whine because I get to watch baseball all day and there's nothing better than that. So I'm excited. It's going to be a great day of of baseball and uh, let's go. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about that great day of baseball. We're going to talk about your pitching props for today in a second. But first, I want to talk to you because strikeout props are always lower this time of year. It's in part because like you're facing good teams and they grind out at bats, but also Pitch counts are tough to pin down. That's the the issue I've been having is I get very nervous about betting K props this time of year because it's hard to know. It seems like it's kind of a mentality thing, though, uh, both by the team and the pitcher. So what are you kind of using to judge how long you think a guy will go in a game when you're making these strikeout recommendations? That is a great point and a lot of times it's a balance like i i like a pitcher who's been there a pitcher that that's a horse with a bullpen that they kind of want to make sure they don't overextend early yeah. so it's yeah. like you have to guess um and all the best guess is like this is tough and yeah. you know for folks out there yeah i watch a lot of baseball and a lot of baseball like i probably watch more pitchers than anybody around yeah and it doesn't mean you're going to be right because there's right. so many variables. And this is one big one. Like there are teams that just don't K. Um, they yeah. grind out at bats. I thought the, uh, I mean, I thought the Mets had some great at bats in the last yeah. series. I think, you know, Cleveland's always got, got a good approach at the plate. That doesn't mean anything if they're facing a, a, a pitcher that's still going at them, but right. it's something you have to keep in mind. And, and, and also do teams want to get to hand it off to the bullpen early, get a win, <laughs> or are they going to ride their horse and save things? Yeah, I think it's just important to keep in mind as you open up FanDuel Sportsbook, you check out the strikeout numbers. They're going to feel low when you look at them, but that's for a reason. And that's because of the things you just mentioned. So just keep that in mind when you look at them. Don't just, you know, make sure you keep that in mind. So let's open up the board for you, Rob. When you look at the pitching props available for today at FanDuel Sportsbook, which ones do you feel confident in based on the combination of factors we just discussed? Yeah, based on the combination of factors, I'm going Garrett Cole, 6Ks or more. And then I'm going to do a same game parlay with Furlander for seven K's or more and Logan Gilbert for four K's or more. 
And I think that all those guys are horses. You know, we've seen these guys go deep in games throughout the year. Cole went like 120 pitches at one point. Verlander, we know he can go deep. Hasn't done it a ton this year, but I think that was in part because they had October in mind for him. I want to start things off here uh, with Verlander facing off with the Mariners. That's a that's a pretty tough lineup, but I think that the 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 big thing there is, especially the second half of the year, Verlander turned into a higher strikeout pitcher than he was the first half. What led to that surge for him? You know, that that's a great question. It's hard to tell. I just thought he looked very, very sharp and locked in. Probably wanted to drive home the Cy Young Award. Maybe it was, yeah. full, you know, be, being healthy, coming back, saying this is a stretch run. I'm gonna. I want to carry this team to the World Series. I, you know, I'm in a Cy Young race. I want to win that. He wants to win everything, and that's what I like about <laughs> Justin Verlater in this. Like that's why I feel good about that number. Is he's been really sharp, and dude is a competitor, and I know he just wants to show his stuff in this game. And he's shown that stuff throughout the entire year. We know what Max like, or what just a Real legend Real is. Yeah, yeah he's a legend. He's been fantastic. Um, and I think that that side of the game, it's easy to have a lot of faith in there. Now, Logan Gilbert, not as proven in the postseason, but I'm actually on board with you. I was going to ask you about Logan Gilbert in the alternate market. Uh, for him to get five plus strikeouts is plus 172. You've got him at four plus, which is minus 140 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Part of the reason why the counterpoint to mine is that the Seattle bullpen is sick. And you could see a case where they're like, okay, we don't want him going too far in games. But Gilbert, I mean, I don't care about like, you know, what he did against the Astros in the regular season, but he was sick. He was very good in those matches. That doesn't hurt things. And also it seemed like recently had a little bit more strikeout juice. He's got that competitive nature. So I got on him because of the way he pitched down the stretch and having faith in him in this matchup. What put you on Gilbert for today? I think a lot of it's that. So what I was torn for, torn by with uh, with Gilbert is the line between getting keyed up and wanting to dominate and getting too keyed <laughs> too up. Far. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> and like he, he is, talk about a competitor. That dude breaks out a whole different personality when he's on the bump. And sometimes it works out really well. And other times, you know, it, it, you can get over keyed up. And I, I'm I'm hoping that he's been through this season enough that he knows exactly how hype he needs to get. Yeah. But yeah, he absolutely can, you know, can can K a bunch of folks. He can touch, you know, upper 90s with his fastball. And and when he's pitching, when he's on, he's he's tough. So yeah, like it's a crap shoot. Like I, I was wondering the same thing. That's why I was a little bit lower with the four K's on him because he could, you know, he could K seven or eight. You don't know. Right. And, and the Volatile. bullpen. Yeah. And the bullpen things loaded. So yeah. do you want to hand it off or do they want to make sure if you shoot it all at once, you know, do you have that bullpen later in the series? Maybe you want to let him go a little longer. Right. I don't know. It's a tough balance for sure. And I think that that's a, that's a concern with him, but I think that I have faith in the pitcher it's the other factors that could give you pause, but I think that's why I was on Gilbert personally. Let's talk about Garrett Cole. You mentioned that, that guardians team, how disciplined they are with having good plate appearances and making sure they are making that pitcher work. They're putting the ball in play. They've got a lot of guys with a contact type profile. What does Garrett Cole do that better positions him to get strikeouts against that lineup than what most guys do? To me, it's a combination of his experience. So he is your horse. He is an elite yeah. pitcher in the major leagues. I know he's up and down sometimes with, you know, performance stuff, but I know he wants it too. Yeah. And having a guy like that to lead off, set the tone, he knows how important that is. He is a pitcher that even if you're trying to make contact, he throws so hard and has such good stuff. I don't know that it matters. And, uh, you know, that's the flip side. Like it could be Cleveland, just they try to grind out at bats the whole yeah. game but is that going to be effective against you know 99 100 i don't know, I don't know. <laughs> it might not be i mean it's it tough to be not. effective against I, I care like you said there can be times where let's some home runs and stuff like that but even in those games the strikeouts are typically still there uh so the the four the three leg parlay for rob here logan gilbert four plus strikeouts individual leg there minus 140 justin verlander seven plus strikeouts individual leg there plus 118 and then cole six plus strikeouts minus 172 for a combined three leg parlay of plus 468 over at FanDuel sportsbook and rob i think even if these don't hit we're still winners we get to watch justin verlander we get to watch garrett cole we get to watch max freed on the bump today. So that's a, that's a good day of baseball. And I'm excited to, to see how it all goes. 
And, and we just get to talk baseball. So we're winners automatically. Like just doing this, we're winners. I could By not golly. agree more. I could not agree more. <laughs> that is Rob Freeman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Find his work at MLB Fox, Nesson, and Peacock. Rob, enjoy today. Uh, get some coffee breaks in. You know, get some food in you at some points too to try to marathon this whole thing. And uh, looking forward to talking to you again uh, some point during this postseason. Well, it's been great as always. Yeah, I'm cooking ribs during the game, so this should be Ooh, fun. Man, yeah. good yeah. day. Okay, that'll, that'll help with the uh, that'll help with making it 11 hours of having ribs on the ribs available to you too. Totally. All righty, thank you, Rob. Enjoy the baseball Thanks. for today. All righty, that was Rob Freeman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja and watch some fantastic gifts and some fantastic baseball throughout the day for today. We're going to break down my first look at NFL week number six here in just one second. But first, quick reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. We, of course, are on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, you name it, you can find us there. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, Leave us a rating and review as well. Twisted T and FanDuel join forces to bring you a one-of-a-kind contest series that gives you a chance to compete for your share of thousands of dollars in site credit. Introducing Twisted T's College Football Picks, a sports betting-focused contest series that's entirely free to play. The contest is simple. Each college football game will be assigned money line, spread, and total markets with assigned points to each market. All you have to do is make six selections based on those three markets and earn points for each correct selection you made. At the end of the day, your score ranks among the best in the contest. You will be eligible for your share of site credit. Head to FanDuel.com slash Twisted picks and make your picks. And reminder, please drink responsibly. Let's dig in here to NFL week number seven, week number seven, Ooh, trying to jump ahead, week number six here and break down where my numbers are showing value across FanDuel Sportsbook. One of these is one that has been a bit on the move throughout this morning as potentially a reaction to last night. That is a Chiefs taste facing off against the Buffalo Bills. And right now over at FanDuel, you can get the Chiefs plus three. That is minus 114. I'm showing value there, but also I think I'd kind of rather go with the Chiefs money line. That's plus 130 right now at FanDuel Sportsbook, and I want that. Uh, my numbers actually say the Chiefs should be favored in this game by 1.49 points, so 4.49 points deviant from what the market says. And that is my model that, can, that combines a preseason prior with what teams have done so far this year. I'm also running an alter, alternate model right now that does look at just 2022. It's not my betting model, but it's one that I want to look at to kind of judge, okay, am I underreacting to what we've seen so far this year? By that model, the Bills should be favored. That's fair, because they're the best team in football based on that 2020-only model, but it's only by 0.21 points. And that's what gives me more faith in going with the Chiefs money line once again at plus 130. Obviously, the Chiefs just played a huge game on Monday night. They had to, you know, press for that entire game, whereas the Bills got to coast for like the final three quarters of Sunday. Now they go to Kansas City. I think that those factors do favor the Bills. Do they favor them enough to get this money line to plus 130 and make me feel good about backing the Bills in this one? No, I want to go with the Chiefs here. Both my models align in saying the Chiefs are undervalued. So to me, the first bet I'm locking in for week number six will be the Chiefs money line plus 130 against the Bills in that game in Kansas City. We could see that number keep on moving because it was plus 118 this morning. Um, so you could see more movement, but honestly, if you want the plus three, I'd probably get that now. I There's no chance. I don't think we get to three and a half. Maybe you hold off if you want the money line, but personally, plus 130, I'm ready to fire, and we'll take that there. I think that is further than it should have gone based on what we've seen so far from these two teams. Another money line I like uh, for this week is actually on another island game. That is the Thursday night game, potentially the grossest game the entire week. That is the Commanders at the Bears, and uh, the Commanders money line right now is plus 104, and I will be willing to take that uh, right now on the Commander side of plus 104. Obviously, Bad vibes with the commanders right now. We saw that Ron Rivera press conference yesterday talking about how the quarterback was the reasoning their team had had struggled. But my numbers said the commanders favored by 1.56 in this game. Uh, the spread is at one point. I want the money line here to get the commanders at plus 104. And if I, again, turn to that 2022 only model, so focusing on the commanders this year with Carson Wentz, that says they should be favored by 1.4 points. And again, they're underdogs in this game, slight dogs, but dogs nonetheless. So similar to the chiefs one, 
my, the betting model that I use, the one that combines a prior with what we've seen so far this year, it says the commander should be favored. And the 2022 only model says it should be favored as well. So again, I like it when those two were in agreement. I'm not leaning a ton on the 2022 only model. It's kind of more of a check with me kind of thing to make sure I'm not overreacting to or underreacting to certain stuff. Um, and when they both align, I will take that. Uh, so commanders plus 104, uh, the Bears one run the football, but the commanders pretty good against that rank. They rank third against the rush based on my numbers. So they should be pretty able to keep the Bears very good rushing offense in check. And that gives me faith in, in plugging them at plus 104 against Chicago. So uh, Chiefs plus 130, Bears plus 104. The other one is uh, one I am delighted to get to talk about, and that is... Uh, betting against a team that has given me a lot of extra gray hairs so far this year. Uh, that's the Arizona Cardinals. I finally get to bet against them. That money line for Seattle on the opposing side of that game is plus 120. So we're getting Seattle here as home underdogs against an Arizona team that has been dysfunctional so far this year. Now, I do have a downgrade in Seattle for Rashad Penny being out. Obviously, you don't see a lot of running backs who truly, truly move the needle. Penny has been that. Like, his rushing efficiency has been off the charts both last year and this year. So not having Rashad Penny in this game does negatively impact Seattle for me. But Kenneth Walker, very good um, early down back based on what he showed at Michigan State. Had a, a huge touchdown run last week. I think it is partly infrastructure in Seattle. Uh, Penny was great. But, like, they have a good infrastructure in place. It still allow them to be good even with no Rashad Penny. So I think the offense will still be fine. Uh, the prior uh, model that I have here does favor Seattle by 0 0.30 points in this game. So plus 120 in the money line, it has moved. So I would get this one now if you want to bet it, because uh, I think that it is moving towards Seattle's direction. The 2022 only model heavily favors Seattle here. So again, alignment between those two. So I will go Seattle plus 120 against Arizona. And I would get that one now because I think that one will continue to shift uh, towards the Seahawks uh, in this game. One other one I'm, I'm going to do, but I'm less confident in than the other ones is the Cowboys money line at plus 190 against the Eagles. I've got the Cowboys at 37.7% to win this game. Their implied odds are 34.5%. But that's what the Cowboys being moderately. I, I think that I'm kind of low on them in my numbers, but still showing a bit of value here. I've been hesitant to react to Cooper Rush playing well. Obviously, Dak could play. Uh, I don't I'm based on what I've heard this morning, based on what I've read, I don't think he's gonna play, but like, you know, there's a shot he could play and that'd be an upgrade for sure. But I'm assuming right now Cooper Rush would be the quarterback here. And obviously Sunday was not a result of Cooper rush. Didn't play that great. The offense didn't have to do a whole lot to win that game. I've been hesitant to, to up the Cowboys in my numbers. So I think that what I have for Dallas right now is a fairly conservative estimation of what their offense will be under Cooper rush against the Eagles uh, Eagles defense, but I'm still showing a bit of value on their money line at plus plus one ninety. So if you were asking me to, to, rattle off my level of confidence in each of these money lines. I would say the Cowboys are last, still willing to do it, but they are last for me. I would say Seattle's probably the one I had the most confidence in, uh, plus 120 against Arizona. I would say Chiefs plus 130 against the Bills is next up. Uh, or, and then uh, I go Commanders third, just because it's hard to have a lot of faith in a team quarterback by Carson Wentz. So my favorite bet so far this week is Seattle plus 120. I would go the Chiefs next, plus 130 against the Bills, or plus... Plus three, if you want to go that route instead, uh, then the commanders plus one Oh four. And then the Cowboys, uh, plus one ninety against the Eagles. I took it, but I understand if you don't want to go that route, because it's hard to justify betting against the Eagles with how they've been playing so far this year. There are some other spots where I'm showing value, but I'm not going to bet it. At least as of now, I'm showing value in the Steelers money line plus 300 against the, the bucks. Lesson learned, not a huge gap. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, go at that one there. So I'm passing up the Steelers for right now. I'm showing value of the Patriots plus three in their game against Cleveland. I kind of want to see what Mac Jones status is because I'm not sure how big of a downgrade I would make it to be Bailey Zappi for this game, but I kind of want to have more clarity in the situation. I think of the ones that I'm not betting yet. That's the one that I'm most willing to bite on later on this week, depending on where the markets go. So holding off um, for where that one is right now, uh, the Patriots plus three against the Browns. I would show value in the Panthers' money line at plus 385 against the Rams. I have a downgrade in there for P.J. Walker, but like also, woof. 
Um, I get the Rams have not looked good, but yikes. Uh, yikes, buddy. I, I've had bad selection this year. If I look at all the, the money lines where my numbers have shown value, I've, you know, it's uh, a decent ROI, but I haven't taken a lot of the ones that have had the best returns. Maybe this is one where I'm like, okay, I can't bet this and it winds up cashing. I don't care. I, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to bet this Carolina team right now on the money line plus 385. I will pass there. The final one uh, where I'm showing value that I'm not betting right now is the giants money line at plus 190 against the Ravens. The reason I'm not going here is I think that my model is a bit too low on the Ravens. It's not a huge gap between what my numbers have and what the market has. So that's why I'm a bit hesitant there. Now the 2022 only model, which I think is, is a better judge of the Ravens than, than my priors model. That one does still show value in the Giants at plus 190, but, um, you know, so both my numbers, my models do align and saying the Giants are value here. I don't quite feel good enough about it, though, to actually fire. So I'll hold off there. So the ones I'm, I'm officially recommending for today are the Chiefs plus 130 money line, Commanders money line plus 104, the Seahawks money line plus 120, and the Cowboys money line plus 190 against the Eagles. Less confident in that one, but still one I am willing to ride with here on Tuesday. Of course, we'll have more thoughts on this week six slate, which is a really fun one, coming up on Thursday, with their full betting breakdown. And then on Friday, we'll have JJ Zacharyson on, talk player props as well. Let's now dig into our recap of last week, as they do each and every week here on covering the spread. Starting the college side, Ed had a couple, uh, Ed Fang, that is, uh, found him on Twitter at the Power Rank. Couple bets on TCU Kansas, and it depends on when you got those, because when we talked, it was TCU minus seven. The total was 68 and a half. Ed liked TCU minus seven, and the over at 68 and a half. I was actually able to get TCU minus six and a half after we spoke. Uh, I believe they got that on late Wednesday. It was six and a half. It did get to seven and a half at one point. So clearly once it got six and a half money came in on TCU. Once it got seven and a half money came in on Kansas and it went back to seven and it closed there. Total closed at 70 and a half. So I cashed TCU minus six and a half because it finished at seven. Exactly. Ed pushed on minus seven. I feel pretty lucky to win that one with Jalen Daniels uh, getting banged up. Um, Obviously, they still played very well without him. Um, and, you know, he wasn't lighting things up there. Uh, so I feel pretty lucky to have cashed that bet. But uh, still a nice read by Ed there. Ed got the over at 68 and a half too, finished with 69. So hopefully he got there before that total got up to 70 and a half uh, to get the over on that one. But at 68 and a half, uh, Ed got that one and then had the push on TCU minus seven. If you got a six and a half, you got the win there as well. Uh, but overall, I think a pretty good day uh, for Ed on the college side of things. On the NFL side, pretty mixed week for me. The stupid Cardinals finally paid off. Um, I got them at plus five and a half. They did cover that. They lost by three. And I said on Tuesday, the reason I was going with the Cardinals plus five and a half as opposed to the money line was because I didn't want to risk Cliff Kingsbury messing up my money with a late game decision. Turns out it was Kyler Murray I had to worry about, not Cliff Kingsbury. But hey, didn't worry that much as long as they... Didn't go to OT and give up a touchdown. I was going to be okay. And that's how things played out. They missed the field goal. So did get the Cardinals plus five and a half. I pushed on the Vikings minus seven, but I also had them in a two leg teaser with the Bucks. Uh, that was the uh, the Vikings minus one, Bucks minus two and a half. When we talked on Tuesday, the Vikings won by seven, Bucks won by five. Uh, that was minus 134 for the two leg teaser. That went pretty well there. Obviously, they didn't play as well as I thought they might, uh, but still, uh, th that's why we do teasers every now and then. Again, they're not a huge part for me just because I need to have value on both sides uh, to, to be willing to bet it, but um, that one did work out there. I had the Bengals plus 150 on the money line, so I actually did like Zach Taylor going for the touchdown on fourth down. I thought that that was the best route to potentially winning that game. I seem to be alone in that, which is fine, uh, but... As someone who wanted the Bengals to win based on my betting interest, I actually thought it was an okay decision. So personally, I was on board with it. Didn't work out. They did cover. Uh, plus three did not get the money line for me. Uh, but I still feel good about the way they played that game. I still feel good about the bet. Just didn't quite cash on that one. I had the Dolphins money line at minus 178. That was pretty dead early with the Teddy Bridgewater injury. The Jets played well against the Dolphins defense too. So honestly, even if Teddy hadn't gotten hurt, I'm not sure if I would have won that bet. But you know, circumstances out of the, out of the control there. I don't think it was a bad bet. I don't think I deserved to win it. Even if Teddy had been healthy, but I uh, didn't win it either way 
On Thursday, I had a couple bets here on the show. We were talking with Ryan. I added the Steelers money line at plus 640. Close it at plus 610, but closing line value, don't pay the bills. Uh, with the way that game uh, went down, they got toasted. That's why I didn't want the spread at, at plus 14 because I knew a, 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 a romp was well within the range of outcomes. I think that the money line was the preferred way to go there. Um, didn't cash either way, but I still think that the the unwillingness to bet the spread I feel good about spending the money line, you know, closing line value, et cetera, et cetera. But whatever that one is, how it was. Other one I added Thursday was the chargers. I said Thursday, I wanted to wait. And so after Keenan Allen got ruled out and miles Garrett was ruled in to bet that one. Cause I thought there would be movement towards uh, the Browns after that. And that did happen. Uh, money line was minus minus one twenty Saturday. When I got that spread was minus one and a half then as well. Both those cashed, uh, barely, um, but got a better price in the money line if you waited and a, a better number on the spread as well. And if you had gotten it two and a half, which it was Thursday, would not have cashed, which is why getting a read on which way you think the markets will go is obviously very important. And that's why I was willing to wait on the Chargers there and uh, take them later on. So luckily I did because that did help me out quite a bit there. Then last night, a uh, split ticket for me. I had Josh Jacobs over 18 and a half receiving yards and Jarek McKinnon under 25 and a half rushing plus receiving. He had 30 on one run. Um, that was a very tilting run. And then he looked good. So they kept going him. So unders can be frustrating to, to sweat because you're like, okay, they could still burn me late in the game. I'm winning this right now, et cetera, et cetera. But if they go over in the second quarter, who cares? So yeah, at least I lost that one early. Jacobs, though, that one, uh, he almost doubled that total. So next week overall, I feel pretty good about the way things went. I feel okay about the way my numbers are back testing. I'm glad that I have this alternate model right now that I'm running with 2022 only numbers. Again, not betting based on that one, but kind of using it as a check uh, to see if I'm going the right direction with things. And... I think that will help us in the long run. Ryan Williams, find him on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Great game last night to spin a profit week. He was two and four on Sunday, uh, but really sick Monday for Ryan. He did miss on the Derek, uh, Derek Carr to throw a pick, which is minus 102. Miss the Chiefs, minus seven and a half. Miss the Chiefs, team total over 31 and a half. But uh, he also had an anytime touchdown on Isaiah Pacheco, plus 210. But the big one hitting for Ryan was Travis Kelsey to score twice at plus 600. He did it four times, so he doubled that one up. Uh, he also cashed Patrick Mahomes over two and a half passing touchdowns at plus 132. He had Travis Kelsey over six and a half receptions, which was minus 120. And Kelsey got seven. He had like 25 yards, but had seven catches. So uh, a two and four Sunday for Ryan, but a profitable week based on most of that Kelsey uh, double touchdown game. Uh, and the Mahomes over two and a half passing touchdowns, the Kelsey reception one. He also had the Josh Jacobs um receiving yardage number over 18 and a half. So good week by Ryan, especially on Monday to close things out. Player prop show on uh, Friday. JJ Zacharyson also talked about Josh Jacobs. He had 154 yards rushing, 39 receiving and a touchdown. So any market you went to for Josh Jacobs, buddy cashed. He was awesome uh, in that one. Other one for JJ was Damian Pierce. He mentioned him in the situations to monitor. He had 99 yards rushing, 14 yards receiving. So the situations to target section has been a very good one to JJ so far this year. We talked about Ramondre Stevenson there earlier on this year. It's been a very good section. So if you're listening on Friday, I think that although we give like yardage and touchdown recommendations, I'd listen most closely to the situations to target one because that's been a really good read by JJ overall this year. Uh, Owen two on touchdown bets uh, and one for three on yardage bets. Allen Robinson under 39 and a half receiving yards did hit there. AJ Dillon, uh, passing yardage and Nick Chubb receiving yardage or, or uh, AJ Dillon receiving Nick Chubb receiving yardage. Both those numbers went under AJ Dillon got a, a role reduction Sunday. It seemed like they lean more on Aaron Jones. So didn't get the Dillon one Chubb only one target was early on. Uh, he went under seven and a half receiving yards, but the situations to target section been really good one to tune into so far this year. So hopefully you're able to get in on, uh, Josh Jacobs and Damian Pierce, Take advantage of what JJ was saying on those. We, of course, do have JJ back once again this Friday. We got Ed Fang and Ben Stevens on tomorrow to talk some college football as well. That show should be up probably around 2 p.m. Eastern or so tomorrow uh, over on the Covering the Spread podcast feed, and it'll be up on the FanDuel YouTube page after that as well. Thursday show to preview week number six. Uh, Ryan will be out for that because he has to unpack, uh, just moving into his new apartment. So while well, someone else there on Thursday to help me break down 
biggest games of this week. Get all those shows as they are posted by subscribing to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. And also check out the FanDuel YouTube page to get these uh, as they go up there each and every week. Big thank you once again to Rob Freeman for coming on, not just today, but all throughout this entire second half of the MLB season. Check out Rob on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Find his work at MLB, Fox, Nesson, and Peacock. And uh, see if we can get those strikeout props in for Rob for today as well. If you have any questions for me, I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. Good luck to you with your MLB bets for today. Good luck to you with your Week 6 bets. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down some college football. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 